Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming out today. Before we talk about COVID-19, I did want to remind everyone today is the 1st of June, first day of hurricane season, and we actually have a disturbance located over the Yucatan Peninsula. It's called Invest 93L or 93 Lima. Um, and we were told this morning by the National Weather Service out of Slidell uh, that it has an 80% chance of development into a tri tropical cy cyclone. That's now been already been upgraded to 90% uh, since this morning. Uh, it is too early to know where this system will end up, how strong it will be, uh, but we are told that one way or another, because whether it's this system or other weather that's developing uh, in and around the Gulf, we're going to have a very wet end of the week and weekend and maybe start of next week. Uh, and so we need to all be paying attention to that. Um, very heavy rainfall, so I'm asking everyone out there to be prepared. Go to getagameplan.org. Um, make sure that you are ready. Uh, there are differences between responding to a natural disaster uh, when you have a public health emergency with uh, COVID-19 as we currently do and obviously when we do not. Uh, so we will continue to update you on this disturbance as we get more information, but we do encourage everyone to follow the, the weather channel, the local weather broadcasts and, and uh, local officials and so forth. Moving back to today's uh, press briefing on COVID-19, uh, I realized that you didn't have a chance the other day to get all of the numbers because we were having some technical difficulties with our servers or the domain site and so forth. Uh, I can tell you today we're reporting 425 new cases. That brings us to more than 40,000 cases uh, total since the inception of this public health emergency. Right now, we are ranked 10th of all states uh, per capita uh, for cases. And you know that at one time, we were ranked number two in the country for that. So I want to take just a moment and thank the people of Louisiana uh, for doing what was necessary to slow the spread uh, and flatten the curve and then to maintain that effort uh, so that we went from number two to number 10. So I just told you we have 40,000 or so cases total. You see it there, 40,341. We also increased today uh, the number of presumed recoveries, and we are reporting 31,728. Uh, that's obviously a, a positive sign uh, going forward as well. Sadly, today we are reporting four deaths, but as you know from being in these meetings and receiving these numbers for the last few months, uh, that is a relatively low number of deaths. Uh, and so that too is encouraging. Um, but for those families who lost loved ones, obviously um, still a very, very serious thing. And so we should offer up our prayers and our condolences. That is the lowest number of deaths reported since March the 22nd. We have 661 COVID patients in the hospital today. Uh, that is the lowest since March of 25th. Overall, today, with the testing effort, we've completed more than 387,000 tests. Uh, today's uh, report, 3.5% of, of the tests for today were positive, um, and that was on 12,261 tests. As anticipated and as I announced last week, we did exceed our goal of 200,000 tests administered in the month of May. We ended up with 206,858 tests. So that was well in excess of um, the 4.3% uh, that we had uh, set as our goal. Uh, so in the month of May, we more than doubled the test that we administered in the month of April. And I would remind you that the minimum goal that the CDC recommends is 2%. So we're, we're more than twice that and we intend to continue uh, testing at at least that level going forward. We've also reached our goal of 10% positivity or lower on new results for the last 24 days. And we're getting really close to being at 10% overall since the inception of the testing uh, many weeks ago. 
I spent the weekend digging into the data in close coordination with the Office of Public Health, with Dr. B.U. and Dr. Phillips at the Department of Health, with the Fire Marshal and with many others. And I'm pleased to report that we are seeing signs of progress. Louisiana is headed in the right direction, but I have to caveat that by saying there's still a lot of COVID-19 uh, in Louisiana. It's in every community across uh, the state, and so we still have work to do. Uh, we still have some restrictions that, that have to be in place, and, and uh, as I've said so many times, we're not going to be fully back to normal uh, for some time, um, and, and certainly not likely until we have a vaccine. Uh, that is safe, effective, mass-produced, uh, and then administered to some significant percentage of the population. But we are moving in the right direction. Um, we're ramping up our testing. We're ramping up our contact tracing, and you're going to get much more information about this from Dr. Bu in just a few moments. Um, but it doesn't mean that that uh, every region of the state is doing equally well. Uh, although we have less regions of the state today um, that, that are somewhat problematic than, than we've had uh, in the past. Um, there are a couple of areas where we need to continue to monitor very closely, but the truth is we plan to monitor every part of our state very, very closely. That's the whole purpose of the increased testing and the contact tracing. Um, but uh, you'll, you'll get that information from Dr. Bu in just a moment. But with that being said, uh, I do believe and have made the decision that it is appropriate to transition into phase two on Friday of this week when the current proclamation uh, terminates. And so on Thursday, I will be signing a new proclamation uh, to move the state into phase two. Um, and at this point, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Alex B, you to come up and go through some slides with you. If you've got questions about those particular slides, I would ask you to ask them of Dr. B while he's here at the podium. When, when he comes back, I'm sorry, when I come back up, obviously I'll, I'll conclude with some remarks and then I'll take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, so, uh, as we've been doing since before we moved even into phase one, uh, the Department of Health, uh, in coordination with uh, the epidemiologists who work uh, for the Office of Public Health and uh, public health experts from academic institutions uh, and hospitals uh, in, in the state, uh, continue to look at the data about how our epidemic is progressing um, and, and use that to really uh, understand what path we're charting and understand and give recommendations to the governor and his uh, office about how uh, to progress and when to progress. Um, and so uh, just going through the same information, and, and this will be the third time that you've seen us present uh, the data this way. Um, uh, overall, the, the top line and consistent with the recommendation uh, that it would be reasonable to go into phase two uh, is that the state uh, continues to see decreasing um, symptoms of uh, COVID-19, and that's as uh, demonstrated by uh, what we call uh, CLI or COVID-like illness, uh, syndromic surveillance, people presenting to emergency departments with signs and symptoms of COVID, and it's the proportion of those individuals uh, in comparison with everybody else coming to an emergency department. So we continue to see that decreasing. Overall, our cases uh, continue to decrease, and we look at that uh, through a variety of, of ways, and I'll, I'll touch on some of those in a moment. And we continue to see a decrease in hospitalizations. So this chart depicts that, but it also depicts the other point that the governor just made, which is uh, that progress continues, but it is not even across the state. Um, and so uh, while we uh, do feel that overall the trajectory uh, is of decreasing, and you heard the, the data about uh, lower numbers of deaths than, than we've seen in recent days, lower number of cases um, in general than we had months ago, um, uh, fewer hospitalizations uh, than, than you know, really when we're uh, on the upswing, um, we do uh, have have uh, some concerns about uh, various different areas that, that I'll, I'll talk through at a, a high level in a moment. But when we look at um, COVID-like illness in general, we can see that across the state, symptoms, people showing up to emergency departments with symptoms of COVID uh, continue to decrease. With cases, we see a bit more of a mixed bag where we have uh, several areas that um, are, are not 
uh, decreasing or increasing. Uh, there may be slow decreases, but we're calling those essentially uh, plateaued areas. That's region one, the greater New Orleans area. Region two, the southwest area around Lake Charles. Uh, region eight, uh, the Monroe and Delta uh, parishes. Um, and region nine, the, the North Shore and Florida parishes. Um, the, there's a lot of reasons that we could be seeing those, those cases um, uh, not going down. Um, certainly, continued transmission of COVID um, uh, being the, the most underlying cause. Uh, but the other is the work that we've been doing uh, as, as a state, not just as the state government itself, but as a state with partners in academic, um, hospital, um, and private uh, sector labs to increase testing uh, throughout the state, not just in communities, not just in communities that were under tested, uh, like our African American communities uh, and our Latinx communities, but also making sure that we're getting testing into areas where we know that spread happens more frequently and people are more vulnerable, like our nursing homes, uh, our congregate settings, like prisons and adult um, uh, residential settings. And so it's uh, expected that as we see that testing increase, we're going to find more COVID. That's going to mean that you're going to have more cases and give a little bit of a mixed picture here. Um, but, but we also um, uh, are tracking other metrics, like as we continue to increase the amount of testing, what's going on with the proportion of those tests that are positive, that percent positivity that the governor uh, referenced, and I'll show you in, in just a few slides um, how that number continues to improve. And so that helps uh, us as we're looking from a public health standpoint at understanding these plateaued cases and these uh, decreasing cases in some regions um, uh, sort of balance uh, that with, with an overall trend uh, to say that, yes, even as you are finding more cases, as a proportion of total tests, uh, that's still coming down. Region 6, the central area around uh, Alexandria, Rapides, uh, Senla, uh, does, however, show uh, increasing cases, and we're watching that very closely, uh, some of that driven by outbreaks in congregate settings uh, that are in that region, um, but we also are seeing a fair bit of community spread as well. And so again, when we talk about the measures, uh, as I will later on in the presentation, that despite this uh, generally good trend, uh, promising trend, the, the, the decreasing hospitalizations, the decreasing symptoms, despite that uh, general positive news, we must continue to double down on the measures that we know work uh, to decrease the spread and to, to reduce the risk that we continue to see spread in our communities of COVID, most importantly being uh, staying at home if you're sick uh, and wearing a mask when you're out in public um, with people who are not from your, from your household, uh, whether you're outside or inside, and certainly if you're less than six feet away from each other. When we look at hospitalizations, uh, we have uh, consistently seen, uh, by and large, decreases across most of the state. We've also consistently seen, unfortunately, a rise in hospitalizations uh, in Region 8, the Greater Monroe area. Um, it is a relatively small net increase in that region, and we have not uh, come close to uh, exceeding the capacity for hospitals in that region, but it is a steady climb, as you'll see when we look at the actual uh, graphs. Um, now we are also seeing a, a rise in cases, or rather in hospitalizations in Region 6. And so when you put that information together with seeing a rise in cases in Region 6, the uh, central Louisiana, that's another area that we're watching very closely. And um, making sure that we're surging uh, testing uh, capabilities, both at the, at the community and congregate level, um, but also making sure uh, that we are um, uh, uh, getting contact tracing uh, and, and, and the messages about uh, maintaining good public health uh, in those areas. So we look at the next slides. I just wanted to show you a few of, of, the, uh, of the regions uh, so you can kind of get a sense of what this data looks like and, and how we review it. Uh, so these are the statewide trends. Again, these are the similar graphs that we've shown you before. Uh, the, some people may uh, notice that there's a bit of a color change. Uh, sorry for, for individuals who are colorblind because it is a red-green uh, map. Uh, but there is a bit of a change uh, to the middle uh, epi curve in that now the CDC is giving us uh, criteria on which to say uh, there is a, a decreasing uh, trajectory um, or a rebound, which is uh, red. And so you'll see that alternating red and green in certain regions. But overall, as a state, you can see that the symptoms on that curve at the top Cases on that curve in the middle and hospitalizations on that curve at the bottom are, uh, are trending down. If we move on to the greater New Orleans uh, area, region one, um, you'll see that the pattern uh, is the same, maybe a little bit more extreme. We know that uh, uh, the uh, region one has done a, a really excellent job. Uh, certainly the place with the earliest epidemic, the place with the highest uh, rate of rise 
um, early in uh, Louisiana's epidemic, but also uh, really great concerted effort to, to dramatically turn that around and see a decrease. And as you can tell, when I described Region 1 as a plateau for cases, that's really because you have this long tail uh, that we do think over time will continue to decrease. Um, but just looking at the slope, it's, it's relatively flat. Um, symptoms and hospitalizations, however, are down. Now, if we compare that to Region 6, a region where we have more um, uh, concerns uh, with the, the trajectory of, of cases and hospitalizations, you see that uh, when we're looking at symptoms, uh, largely as, a, as a, a result of, of smaller populations, the graph for symptoms is a, is a lot more active and not nearly as smooth. Uh, and we see that in general there's a downward trajectory, um, but, but certainly uh, not the kind of smooth uh, line downward and continued decrease that we'd want to see. So watching that very closely. When we look at cases, we see uh, that there was an initial uh, increase and decrease, but then uh, subsequently there's been this sort of undulating uh, rise now um, uh, since a, a, about mid-April, and we continue to see uh, that rise in cases, again, uh, noting that one of the drivers of increased cases most recently is that we are detecting more. We know that uh, Senla was one of the most under-tested areas uh, in the state, uh, and both through the Office of Public Health and through partners throughout that area, um, through the help of the federal uh, government with supply uh, specimen uh, collection kits, we've been able to get a lot more testing into that region. Uh, and as a result, we're finding a lot more cases. That means there's a lot more to be done uh, on the ground to help Region 6. Um, region uh, 8 uh, is the other region that we have um, uh, concern uh, about, and we've talked about that in the previous two um, uh, discussions about gating criteria. Again, syndromic surveillance, the symptoms have been going down uh, since the beginning. Uh, in the past, uh, however, we've had concerns about both cases uh, and hospitalizations in this region. Hospitalizations continue to increase, again, at a, uh, albeit a smaller uh, a rate and an absolute uh, small number of increases. Uh, fortunately, though, we're starting to see what we hope is the beginning of a, of a bending of the curve uh, in Region 8 with what looks like a plateau over the uh, weekend. Uh, now, if you sort of chart 14 days out uh, on, the, on the epi curve, that middle curve. So again, it's very undulating. We know that this stuff can change over time. Region 8 is another area that was uh, significantly under-tested for, for most of April and May has been a big focus uh, trying to get more tests there. So we want to continue to see that as we get more testing in these communities uh, that we find fewer cases. And the way that that's going to happen is this, if we, as we find people, as we do contact tracing in every region of the state, uh, as we advise people to isolate if they're cases, as we advise people to quarantine, stay at home, um, if they've been exposed, uh, that is how we're going to uh, see these curves continue to flatten and, and turn um, by having people keep COVID out of uh, our public spaces and allow our public spaces uh, to open up more. So along those lines, we do want to share a bit of an update on testing overall uh, and contact tracing. Um, as you heard the, the governor announce, we had set a goal um, of uh, doubling the amount of testing that we did in April uh, at the beginning of May. Um, this was uh, a key um, uh, a goal that we shared with the White House uh, and led to their uh, support for uh, the specimen collection kits that have helped us uh, achieve this goal. Um, but that's sort of a, a necessary but not sufficient um, uh, tool to, to get to where we need to be uh, with our testing. And the, the, the real drive was people across the state, uh, academic partners, private labs, um, uh, facilities themselves really standing up and partnering with us to get um, uh, people tested in large numbers and to reach communities that we hadn't had enough reach to in the past. As a result, we did uh, one day early uh, achieve greater than 200,000 tests reported to the, to the state in the month of May. Um, and, and importantly, as we saw that rise in, in overall tests, uh, as depicted by this uh, yellow-orangish line on the graph, we saw a continued decrease in the percent positive uh, results coming back as depicted by those blue bars uh, in the graph. Um, and so that's what we want to see. We, we want to see that we're getting tests out enough that it's changing behavior, changing our ability uh, to, to uh, influence the dynamics of COVID-19 um, and, and see fewer and fewer uh, cases returning um, uh, positive uh, back to us. Um, one of the ways that we do that is through contact tracing. We've been doing that since the beginning of the outbreak, but as you all know, uh, because of uh, resource limitations and the pace at which uh, cases were rising uh, early in the epidemic, we have not been able to do statewide contact tracing in the way that we wanted. Moving into phase one, uh, and right before, we really surged our capacity as a state uh, to engage in contact tracing so that we could move into a suppressive uh, uh, mode where what we're really doing is, as we find a case, reaching out to those people, ideally within the first 24 hours of being notified of that case, 
uh, giving them uh, counsel and advice on the protective measures they need to take for themselves and anyone that they're living with, uh, certainly to isolate. Um, uh, and, and then also uh, trying to find out who might have been ex exposed as a result of their infection uh, and reaching out to those individuals, those contacts who had been within six feet uh, for greater than 15 minutes um, so that we could reach out to them and also advise them to stay home, take measures to protect themselves and their family members from exposure, to monitor for symptoms, and if they already had symptoms at the time of our outreach, uh, to um, uh, be tested themselves uh, so that we can uh, really try to identify, isolate, and sequester or move out uh, of, of general uh, public, uh, the individuals who, who either are infected or may become infected. Um, we uh, had uh, more than 250 Louisianans uh, uh, online as contact tracers uh, after May 15th and have since um, uh, been able to hire uh, 613 Louisianans to serve in this capacity with more than 303 of them uh, trained um, and, and doing this work. Um, and the training uh, continues. We're trying to get uh, really that full number uh, online We've also been doing a lot of uh, sharing with the media and, and, and other venues uh, so that when people get calls from the Louisiana Department of Health, they're not caught by surprise. Um, this shouldn't be something that causes you a great deal of concern. It's really uh, an opportunity to learn more about um, what's going on with potential exposure to COVID-19 and to do your part as a good neighbor uh, to help um, prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. And this will only be successful if people continue to take part, to answer that call, uh, and then to help uh, ensure that, that we protect our neighbors as much as possible. This is a real opportunity um, to do what Louisianans do best and, and look out for each other uh, by doing our own individual um, part. Uh, our goal is to uh, make sure that we don't just have the capacity to reach everybody, that pe but that we do reach people and that they do uh, answer the calls and that we're able to, to not only uh, give them advice on reducing the risk uh, to themselves and to the community, uh, but also importantly, uh, provide uh, or understand the resources that they may need uh, in order to be successful in staying at home during that period of time. Because we know not everybody has the means uh, to just easily stay in their house for two weeks. Um, and so, uh, so far we've been able to um, uh, engage uh, over 218, sorry, 219 uh, cases and contacts uh, that we referred for, for further resource support to be successful in staying at home. So as a result of that, with uh, the data uh, again being, you know, being uh, uh, promising and seeing the increases in testing, seeing the increases in, in, in uh, ability to do contact tracing, um, we felt uh, it was reasonable to move uh, into phase two as we continue to see these trends go forward. Um, and so I wanted to, to touch a little bit on what uh, phase two looks like. The overall big difference between phase one and phase two is in phase one uh, to understand how to maintain a strict social distancing uh, of, of um, you know, greater than six feet amongst individuals. Um, working with the fire marshal's office and understanding how um, indoor settings uh, are, are regulated or, or um, uh, set up. Uh, we'd initially had a, an occupancy restriction of about 25% for those facilities. And so now as we move into phase two, um, that uh, restriction will relax further to allow up to 50% occupancy uh, for most of these venues uh, that you see here. Um, uh, keeping in mind, the goal should still be to stay six feet away from each other. Um, we can be creative about how we do that, perhaps sitting all on the same side of a table at a restaurant, having other people uh, sitting at the same side of a different, you know, a different table at a restaurant. There's gonna be net six feet managed between those groups, even though there may be more tables now in that restaurant. And so some of that is gonna be managed by uh, the people who are the business owners who are gonna be um, uh, really enacting these restrictions. Uh, the re you know, a large part of it though uh, comes back to us as Louisianans and how we behave and how we make choices um, about uh, taking part um, in these various um, uh, uh, sectors that are, that are uh, expanding access. Uh, we'll note that uh, in blue on this list, we have uh, sectors uh, that are, are gonna be added to the proclamation now in phase two that were uh, not open before. Um, and, and this brings in um, uh, much more uh, of, uh, uh, you know, places like day spas, tattoo shops, uh, some recreational um, uh, facilities like um, uh, controlled uh, uh, swimming. We know that we're in the middle of or we're entering summer um, and, uh, and it's gonna be a, a hot one and so we understand a desire for people to, to go out and cool off in any way they can. Again, just reminding people to just be conscious of, of where they are, be conscious of the fact that, that pools uh, are gonna be uh, required to have uh, individuals watch uh, the pool to make sure that we're not congregating, that we're not in contact, that we're not gonna be having um, 
uh, uh, just uh, free, uncontrolled swimming. Uh, this will still be um, with uh, health and safety measures taken to reduce the risk uh, of, of um, uh, transmissions. Uh, nothing reduces the risk more than staying at home, as we've said previously. And importantly, uh, it's important to highlight that uh, individuals who are at high risk for poor outcomes from COVID-19, so individuals who themselves are older than 65, uh, 65 or older, people who have heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, lung disease, um, uh, people who um, have uh, severe uh, obesity, um, that, and, and any reason that your immune system is not working as normal, the recommendation is that for you, you're still essentially in phase zero. You need to, to stay at home if at all possible. Reach out to friends, neighbors, families to help uh, with delivery of groceries and with delivery of, of uh, medications. Um, these uh, uh, sectors that are opening up um, are not really intended for people in those high-risk categories because, again, there is still a lot of COVID in our communities. We know of, we estimate about a little over 8,000 cases um, based on the cases that we know of, but we know that the cases that we know of don't touch all of the cases that are in the state. And so even as we open up these sectors, it's important for us all to be very mindful of the fact that the threat from COVID-19 still very much remains and that we need to take steps uh, to, to make ourselves and others safe. And on that last point, I would just point out, even if you're not in a high-risk group, you need to evaluate whether you live with somebody or come into a lot of contact with somebody who's in a high-risk group. And as you're making decisions about the risks that you take, that you take very much uh, on board that you could present a risk of uh, acquiring COVID-19 and transmitting it to somebody who themselves could have a really bad outcome. We've been fortunate to have the fewest numbers of deaths reported uh, since we began um, uh, you know, in the last two days. But we want to keep that trajectory. I think nothing would make me sadder uh, than for us to, to uh, suddenly have that rate uh, increase, and, and I'm sure that that's true for the, for the governor as well. So, so there's some practices to make this work, uh, to be able to re-engage the economy, to be able to, 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 to start this work of, of, of restarting our economy that we all have to do. It's not uh, that we can just return to normal life pre-COVID. Um, and, and the most important thing that we want to emphasize is really the new normal of wearing a mask. That is going to remain until we have adequate herd immunity, until enough of us are protected from COVID-19 that the risk of spread uh, widely um, is dramatically reduced. And public health experts tell us that without a vaccine, that could take up to three years. Um, and so that's, a, that's something to keep in mind, that we really need to be building in uh, to our mindset comfort with the masks and the use of the mask and the comfort with telling each other and reminding each other uh, to wear masks. Um, because what we've learned, especially since the, uh, uh, in the recent months since the outbreak, um, is that one of the main modes of transmission of this virus really is through um, uh, the, the particles leaving our mouths and nose as we cough, sneeze, yes, but also as we speak, also as we sing, also as we play instruments. These are ways that, that the breath in our lungs it, it flies out and, and, and into the room. And that's how so many cases of COVID are being spread in our communities. Masks are a really critical way of keeping what's, uh, what I'm breathing out, sneezing out, coughing out from reaching all of you. Um, and so vice versa. It's, it's my role as a good citizen to wear that mask and, and avoid you um, uh, becoming inadvertently infected. Because the other thing that we've learned through this epidemic is that a significant number of us may have COVID-19 and not have symptoms. And thus inadvertently, um, we could be spreading. And that's why, even if you feel well, we do recommend you wear the masks. Um, would also uh, note that the, all the good hygiene practices that we've talked about before, we need to continue. Stay at home if you're sick. Even if it's not COVID-related illness, COVID has shown up uh, in symptoms like an upset stomach. Or as we've seen with very young children, sometimes what looks like an inflammatory syndrome where um, we have uh, uh, challenges with uh, uh, other, other uh, body parts, other organs in the body. It's really hard to, to, to really say something is definitively or not uh, COVID. The safest thing you can do is stay home, call your provider, and get advice from them on what kind of testing, what kind of measures to take. Um, certainly wash your hands um, and, and, uh, and maintain distance. Again, if you don't need to go out, don't. If you don't need to be close to people um, that you don't know, don't. And when you're going to one of these places that you want to engage in, uh, in in the public, if you see nobody's wearing their masks, if you see that there's too many people, they're not adhering to the guidance that the Office of Public Health, that the State Fire Marshal has provided, do, do your job as well as a consumer uh, in not patronizing that area. Don't put your life in, in, uh, at risk uh, for something like a, a bowling game. Uh, you need to look and see, does this look safe? And, and that's gonna be how we make sure we all are doing what we can to reduce the, uh, to reduce the spread. 
Um, again, most importantly, we want to reduce the risk for the most vulnerable amongst us. And so I just want us to be uh, conscious and, and, and we'll continue to provide more guidance on um, not only taking uh, measures to, to reduce our risk, if we ourselves um, uh, are high-risk individuals, but thinking about the people around us, the people that we interact with, people that we live with, and, and um, uh, not putting ourselves at risk uh, if we could transmit uh, COVID to them. And for employers to think about who do I put on the front lines dealing with customers, making sure that we're not putting high-risk populations on the front lines and at risk, making sure that we're also asking people who themselves are not high-risk on the front lines, um, do they themselves have uh, people who are in high-risk in their households? And is there, are there other positions in my business that I could put them in that would reduce their um, risk of transmitting something that they get at work uh, to their uh, family members and, and result in a, in a poor outcome? So there's a part of this that all of us can do, uh, and I appreciate uh, the continued support of the public uh, who by and large are wearing masks and doing all of these measures. Uh, and as we move into phase two, we need to redouble those efforts and continue uh, to work to reduce the, the spread of, of COVID-19. So thank you. And so with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Sam. Sorry, those are, those are individuals who are getting uh, resource coordination. So of the people that we reach out to, um, uh, most people are able to, to stay at home through their own means. They have family members or others who can support them. 219 is the number uh, that needed a, a bit more, whether that's housing support, food support, these other social supports that are really critical to being able to be successfully uh, or successful in staying at home for, for isolation or quarantine. So you know there's how a, many of that 90% you actually uh, I don't off the top of my head. I can tell you that we do have challenges with people uh, not answering the phone, even though it says LDH. I can tell you that even when we do reach people, um, many people uh, don't always remember the, the numbers of, of people or the names of people uh, that we're trying to reach. And so uh, one of the things we talked about before we started contact tracing, we continue to do, is, is uh, try to gather as much data, uh, not only from within the state, but from other states about what's successful, um, how can we improve the impact of contact tracing, uh, because that is really our critical weapon uh, against COVID-19. And so we are continually trying to learn from it to make it more effective. Other questions? Um, Please. When you, as far as the assistant living facilities and things like that, um, they were included in nursing homes. So we were posed the question, why were the assistant living centers kind of lumped in with nursing homes uh, as far as not having visitors and things like that? So, so in general, when we think about congregate settings, there's sort of two risks that we worry about. One is the risk of transmission within that setting. We know that there's a, a significant amount of asymptomatic spread from COVID-19. Studies from the New England Journal and others have shown very high levels of uh, people who have no symptoms that are later found to have had COVID or have active COVID. That presents a real risk in a setting where we're gonna be in very close contact, but we're not um, necessarily able to, to keep ourselves separate. So in that way, an assisted living facility is somewhat similar to uh, a nursing home. Nursing homes present another specifically uh, unique risk category for bad outcomes for the people who actually live there because either they're uh, uh, more likely to be uh, 65 or older or they're more likely to have one or more of those underlying conditions that put them at a higher risk for a severe case of COVID and, and potentially death. And we've had a significant number of our deaths in state associated with those nursing homes. So we're, we're trying to uh, certainly address both of those. Um, and, and we do make a distinction between nursing homes and assisted living and other adult congregate settings in the way that we report the, report the data, because it's, it's not fair to sort of paint everything with, with the same brush. Another question, museums like the Knock Knock, um, not open, but some other areas, parks, et cetera, are open. Why the, the treatment? So, so one of the things we have to think about is what's going on in a setting um, and what makes a certain museum high risk or not. And it really comes down to how is COVID spread? So when we think about any of these settings, it's spread through the air by um, the things that are coming out of our, our mouths and noses as we, as we sneeze, cough, and breathe. Um, so generally walking through a museum where you're not touching anything, you're sort of reading tableaus, you can be spaced uh, and move along in an orderly fashion, we think that presents a lower risk than a setting where uh, there's a lot of congregating around 
um, uh, uh, you know, certain objects, or in this case where you're specifically touching or playing with communal items that are really hard to keep clean. And that's been a cause of a lot of discussion as we think about moving children's uh, museums uh, back into, into phase two, uh, thinking about um, those exhibits. So it's, it's not enough to say that they're just, again, open for normal business. They're going to have to look at their own exhibits and present uh, ideas to us on how they're going to limit the, the risk of spread because people are touching objects and then inadvertently touching their faces. I think everybody doesn't want their, uh, nobody wants their facility to be the cause of a spread of COVID-19. And so what we're trying to do both with the fire marshal regulations and with OPH recommendations is empower people to understand the best practices to reduce the spread. Please. So it, it remains to be seen. I think there, there's a really general um, uh, agreement that that group uh, really presents the highest risk for COVID spread. And so even if you look at the White House guidance, they clearly say uh, no visitation uh, in hospital uh, and, and uh, nursing home settings in, in phase two. What we don't know is what you know next month is going to look like several months down the road. As we've said before, we know that there's work on a vaccine. It's probably a year away. Um, what we you know, also have seen, though, is that in a pretty short amount of time, a medication can come on, uh, on board that suddenly changes the way that we manage the disease. Remdesivir is not a silver bullet. It's not enough to say, it's OK. If somebody gets infected, we can cure them. We're not at that point like we are for, say, hepatitis C. Um, but we don't know what later in the summer, what early fall will bring. Um, not only that, also just the, the ability to have more and more personal protective equipment um, is another uh, area that we don't know. So you could imagine a future in which we had adequate ability to protect individuals in those nursing homes and to have very closely monitored, closely coordinated uh, visitation where people are wearing high-grade uh, personal protective equipment. Um, because we have to balance the risk of COVID spread with the risk of loneliness. And in an older age group, the risk of loneliness itself can be deadly. Um, but, but a lot of that, it, there's a lot of factors that change over time. So it's hard for me to predict when we would allow, um, when we would say that it's, it, it's safe under certain conditions to reallow uh, visitation. But I can tell you those are active conversations that we have um, with those communities, with the, the healthcare settings uh, all the time. Can you explain Sam? the rationale for keeping higher restrictions on bars and making them operate at 25% capacity? So um, again, this is an evolving epidemic and we learn more and more over time. Um, you know, even since the White House guidance first came out, um, we've seen uh, settings like bars in the UK uh, and especially in South Korea actually be big driving forces of uh, outbreaks of COVID-19. Um, and so uh, in those settings, they've actually shut down having bars opened up. So they had to open them up and then they had to go back later and say, this caused too many outbreaks, we have to shut these facilities down. We would rather uh, open in a slow, steady, safe manner rather than to have to snap back restrictions. And so as we were looking at the White House guidance that says bars should open up and, and more recent data that clearly shows bars are a very high risk for spread of COVID-19, how do we um, uh, move forward and, and try to uh, uh, engage as much business as possible while reducing the risk as much as possible. And, and again, that's not to say that bars are going to be safe. Uh, people are going to have to be very thoughtful as they're in these bars and take those precautions on board. It's really in their, in an individual's hands, how high risk or how um, uh, unsafe uh, 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 any facility is that they go to. But for bars, the restriction is essentially that the um, uh, patrons will have to be seated at tables uh, at 25% capacity. That both reflects, reflects the fact that overall capacity in a bar is uh, regulated differently than in, say, a restaurant. Um, but it also means that you're essentially turning the uh, interior space of that bar into similar to what restaurants were doing as far as having to be spaced, having to be seated. We um, hope that that will reduce the risk of what we've seen in these other settings where bars present a very high risk for transmission of COVID-19. And that's a lot of information and you did a great job, Dr. B. I want to thank you. Uh, so while phase two does, under the, the White House guidelines, does say that bars should be open, it also says at reduced capacity, especially as it relates to standing room. Um, and, and so that's, that's why these additional restrictions on, on bars, obviously those bars with LDH food permits, they will be treated just like restaurants and, and that continues in phase two as well. Uh, a while ago you asked about uh, nursing homes being closed, 
I'm assuming you met close to visitation uh, and, and he answered that question and obviously uh, we want to reconnect family members, loved ones with folks in nursing homes as soon as it is safe to do so. Um, and when that happens, it will probably be subject to additional measures to, to make sure that that's, that that's safe. Um, and we don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet, but we do know that under the guidelines uh, that were issued by the White House, that is not a phase two activity. With respect to uh, children's museums, they are not closed in phase two. But, the, but they, will, they will be allowed to open, but with certain changes in the way that they operate uh, so that they are going to close down periodically to make sure that they are uh, cleaning and sanitizing. Uh, and there may be certain tactile exhibits that they're going to have to close in order to be open. Uh, but we are not, and, and in fact, there'll be a call with the Children's Museums in about 30 minutes or 45 minutes or something like that to really, to really <coughs> go through all of that. So obviously ongoing uh, data collection and analysis is going to continue uh, to be a part of our COVID-19 response uh, going uh, forward. Uh, you've just heard the key differences between phase one and phase two. You know, we so it, in, in this phase, day spas, t uh, tattoo shops, and just a, a few will be able to operate. And, and by the way, that will be under certain restrictions. And as it relates to those, and really every sector of our economy, we have received tremendously valuable feedback from the task forces operating within the Resiliency Commission that we created. And everywhere that we've been able to, we've been able to incorporate uh, their recommendations into what we're doing uh, as we move forward with this phased reopening approach. Uh, this proclamation will be in place for 21 days. So it will be, uh, it will expire on June the 26th uh, and, and we will go through another analysis to see uh, about the gating criteria and what comes next based on what we learned, both as it relates to the data and what we learned about the virus itself over the intervening uh, time period. Uh, while we are moving into phase two and lifting restrictions, I do want to emphasize that as Dr. B.U. mentioned, there is still risk involved. There is no way for me to stand up here and say that, that uh, if everything operates just as we prescribe it, that, that renders it completely safe. Um, that's, and, and by the way, that's, there's nobody in the world that, that can do that. Um, so everybody needs to take personal responsibility. Uh, make sure you're doing what we're asked you to do. Uh, you probably shouldn't patronize businesses and establishments that don't engage in the types of uh, risk mitigation uh, that we've talked about here today. Um, when deciding whether or not to do an activity, it's helpful to have a way to think, uh, think through how much risk uh, that you would be taking that you're comfortable with, and, and that depends upon your individual uh, circumstances as to whether you're more vulnerable because of a age or chronic underlying health condition or because you may live with someone who is. What we know is more businesses open, more customers go back in, more employees return. As people make more contact uh, with one another, it is more important than ever uh, that individuals wear masks uh, when they are in public and not uh, dealing only with people from their immediate household and they're unable to stay more than six feet away uh, from one another. Um, and as, as Dr. B, you mentioned, the more we learn about this particular disease, we know that the greatest risk of transmission is uh, of an aerosol nature. And, and so the, the masks really uh, do tamp down on that. I would encourage you uh, to, to, again, patronize businesses that are engaging in the basic safety measures. Uh, and, and, uh, and I encourage every business out there uh, to make sure that they're doing what we're asking of them. Um, I can tell you that in addition to requirements, businesses must follow the reopen uh, in phase two. The Department of Health has worked with the Fire Marshal's Office to include in the open safely guidance for phase two good business practices uh, that, that businesses can consider to help keep their employees and their customers safe and to make their customers feel safe so that they will return in the numbers that they need in order to be successful. Uh, these include uh, reservation systems, symptom checking of customers, strongly encouraging masks among customers and so forth. Uh, LDH, in fact, has created a thank you for wearing a mask poster so that businesses can download. 
uh, from the LDH coronavirus webpage. They can print and hang those uh, in their storefronts to show that they care about their employees and their customers. More specific guidance will be provided uh, by the fire marshal's office via opensafely.la.gov. And I want to thank everyone uh, who's been taking the necessary precautions uh, because without doing that, this next step wouldn't be possible. And we would not have made all the progress that we've made over the last number of weeks and months. And so I would encourage everyone in Louisiana uh, to keep up the good work and to remember we all have a role to play. And that continues to be the case going forward. Before I take your questions, I do want to take a moment to speak about the civil unrest we're seeing unfold across the country. Uh, here in Louisiana, uh, we've had a number of protests and demonstrations. Uh, they've been almost entirely uh, peaceful and nonviolent. Uh, our citizens uh, are appropriately expressing their concerns and exercising their First Amendment rights. Uh, I want to thank the faith leaders, community leaders, political leaders across the state uh, who have been in good communication with our office, but with the public at large, uh, and for the role that they are playing in helping our citizens. And I want to thank everyone for keeping their focus on the issues of concern. Obviously, what we saw captured on the video and the unnecessary death of George Floyd, the behavior of that Minneapolis uh, police officer was egregious. It was very far below what's appropriate and acceptable. Uh, I don't think any reputable member of society or of law enforcement uh, would disagree with that assessment uh, or find that his actions were acceptable. You know, not long ago, it was less than four years ago, Louisiana experienced similar protests. I can tell you that Louisiana citizens then handled themselves very appropriately in the way uh, that they demonstrated. Uh, and I want to I want to thank them and and, and tell them we're we're here to work with them going going forward to try to make sure that everyone can. Uh, exercise their First Amendment rights and give voice to their concerns, which are obviously sincere, but that we protect one another when we do that. And we don't engage in violence and, and, and property damage uh, and those sorts of things. We're going to continue to work with uh, local officials, federal officials, and all the state agencies to monitor the situation so that we can be aware of and hopefully stay in front of uh, developments. Uh, and, you know, since 2016, uh, we've made some strides here in Louisiana. We've worked hard. Uh, we've reformed the criminal justice system. We've done it in a bipartisan way. We've also worked to improve the relationship between the community and law enforcement. Law enforcement has changed the way it trains officers and, and so forth. Uh, still, we know that it's not perfect. We uh, have more work to do, and we're committed to making sure we continue uh, that work. So I do ask for everyone's continued prayers for our state, for our nation, uh, and so that we would focus on the changes that we need to bring uh, in our society uh, and, and then get those done. So with that, I will take some questions for a little bit. And that was a long briefing, y'all. That's about 50 minutes. Yes, sir. Governor, on the George Floyd case, uh, lead report to say the president addressed the governors. I assume you're on that call and called said that the governor's actions have been weak, encouraged a kind of a more firm or more firm crackdown on protests and those uh, committing, uh, if not violence, committing you know, damaging property and things like that. Do you believe that the governors overall have been weak? Do you agree with the president's assessment? No, I, look, I'm not going to engage in that. Um, the, the, I was on the call. I think the president was directing himself to certain states where there were obviously uh, many more problems than we have experienced here in Louisiana. Um, I've got all that I can say grace over here uh, with a public health emergency, a legislative session ending today, another one starting tonight. Uh, we've got an economy that is not performing because of the public health emergency, and we have our own issues related to uh, these, these protests. And so I'm just not going to engage uh, in that at all, Greg. Yeah, and I, I suspect, and, and um, your question could potentially be better addressed to a law enforcement officer. I don't know that you have to change the standards uh, because what that officer did uh, is not in any training that he ever received. 
uh, that was inappropriate. It, it wasn't. It wasn't standard police work. Uh, the the it was a gross departure uh, from what is normal and and, and so forth. Uh, and, and it was bad enough with respect to that officer. It's made worse by the fact that you had two or three other officers standing by who didn't intervene and correct the situation on the spot before it ever got to the point uh, of Mr. Floyd's death. And so uh, I don't know that new standards have to be developed. We have to make sure that we're training our officers according to the standards that we have and that we're not employing officers who shouldn't be police officers. So is it a chance to revisit some of the things? Because sometimes when things happen, yeah. it's an eye-opening situation. You know, should you revisit? Sure. And I think you should revisit the, the, the way that we train on the standards that we have. Uh, and I, and I, maybe I misunderstood your question. Uh, what that officer did is not appropriate police work anywhere. And so, so that's not a standard that, that that officer was engaged in. But we need to train them on what the appropriate standards are, train other officers to intervene if they see something like that before it gets to the level of someone's death or serious uh, bodily injury. And then probably we need to do a better job at the outset of hiring officers who, who ought to be police officers uh, and then monitoring that over time. Uh, to make sure that someone who demonstrates that they probably shouldn't remain employed, uh, that they don't get that opportunity to remain employed. Leo? It seems like it took them forever to get here in phase two, but if everything holds true and our trends are good, what's the likelihood that you would begin to consider phase three and the <laughs> school mm -hmm. and uh, force the call? Well, look, we, we've uh, got a proclamation we'll issue Thursday. It's going to expire. Uh, three weeks from Friday, what is that, um, the 26th of June, um, and we, we will determine between now and then whether we meet the gating criteria again for an easing of, of restrictions. Uh, and, and I don't know how to be more precise than that on June the 1st. I, I can only tell you that if the people of Louisiana will continue to do what they have done, uh, and, and uh, follow these, these protocols that we've put in place, then, then I feel really good about our opportunity to move forward. And um, we know that in August, uh, schools need to resume, colleges need to, need to uh, have students on their campuses and all of those sorts of things. Uh, and we're not there yet, uh, either in terms of the calendar or in terms of knowing what the circumstances are. But as we get closer, uh, we will know more, and, and I expect that we will continue to get additional guidance uh, from the CDC uh, and other areas that we can take into consideration as we formulate our plans and make our decisions. Yes, sir. Governor, can you, uh, two more question. Uh, can you address day camps and sleepaway camps? That is a big part of uh, child care and yeah. the workforce again. Also, can you respond to the letter that Jeff Landry and a bunch of Republican lawmakers sent to your office asking for all businesses? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, sleepaway camps uh, are not going to be allowed. Um, there, there's just too much physical contact for, for too long periods of time and, and, and so forth. Uh, summer camps uh, actually in phase one were allowed. If you recall, we put some restrictions on that with one adult and, and no more than nine children asking that they not do assemblies of all the kids present and that they uh, whether it's for enrichment activities or, or uh, uh, for recreation or even for feeding, uh, that's going to change uh, because I think now we're going to be one adult per 25, 24. So it'd be 25 in, in the in the group, but one adult for 24 uh, students. But but again, they they were open in phase one. We're just going to increase the number of individuals. With respect to the letter that I got. Um, Obviously, I got the letter, I think, delivered to me over the weekend. I was happy to read it, and, and like uh, the people who sent the letter, I, too, want to make sure that we can re-engage uh, as much of the economy as possible, but as safely as possible. Uh, there are reasons why um, businesses of different types are treated differently, and that's because of the risk involved with respect to the public health emergency. Uh, and the decisions that we made uh, all along the way have been consistent with the White House phased reopening guidelines uh, that were vetted by the CDC and which themselves treat different businesses and different activities differently. Uh, and so that's, that's why we did that. That's why we continue uh, to do it. Um, and, 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 you know, 
it, it didn't just happen in those guidelines. Uh, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, working through the Cybersecurity and Information Security Agency, has actually promulgated three, at least three, maybe more, uh, sets of guidance on what is essential infrastructure related to businesses. Uh, and so we have followed that as well. So it wasn't just in the, in the uh, guidelines, it was also in the Department of Homeland Security um, uh, information that they have now put out three times. Uh, so we're, we're doing what we can uh, to strike the right balance uh, between re-engaging as much of our economy as we can, reopening businesses, getting more employees back, getting more customers in, uh, all of those sorts of things with the demands that, that, that we have based on the public health emergency. And we're doing it in a manner that is fully consistent with the CDC uh, vetted White House reopening uh, guidelines. Uh, and I would remind the folks who sent the letter and everyone else that at the outset of this public health emergency, uh, unlike many, many other states, in fact, every state that had the kind of cases that we had on a per capita basis, and, and in fact, no other state had the case growth that we had here at one time, um, but we left all manufacturing open, we left all construction open, non-essential retail wasn't closed here. There were many other states that still haven't come close to our per capita uh, cases uh, that when they reopened retail, non-essential retail, they did it for curbside pickup. Well, we never closed the stores here. Uh, so I would just encourage the, the, the folks who wrote the letter to take those things into consideration and we're going to continue uh, to work with them and others as we move our state forward. Yes, sir. Governor, what would you say to the people who naturally get confused with conflicting science? The WHO has said uh, that masks aren't recommended that goes back to the original science yeah. that you and dr adams uh, initially said and then now the cdc and you and dr b all says masks are a it's confusing for people yeah. to hear different sources and, and different from different science yeah and and quite frankly um i'll accept this true what you just said i i, I didn't know that the who may not be advising uh individuals to, to wear masks I will tell you that the, the guidance here in this country changed on that a long time ago. Uh, the CDC initially advised against it, but as they learned more about the virus and the means of transmission, uh, they changed that to, to advise that we wear masks or face coverings, regardless of whether or not we're symptomatic, by the way. Uh, and that's something that I can tell you the Office of Public Health here in Louisiana agrees with. And as we have learned more about how this is spread and the fact that the, the biggest risk of contracting disease uh, comes from exposure to airborne particles, the, the aerosol uh, that, that happens uh, when people speak and cough and sneeze and, and, and so forth. Uh, it just makes it pretty clear to me uh, that wearing a mask uh, is, is essential. If we're going to keep a lid on the cases as we bring more and more people into contact with one another uh, and, and reopen businesses and get places of worship functioning at a higher percentage of occupancy and and all of those things. And so uh, I guess there's always going to be some degree of confusion as guidance changes over time. Uh, but the guidance on the mass has been clear uh, for many weeks now. Uh, it's consistent here in the United States of America. Uh, and everything we're learning only makes it more important, not less, uh, going forward. Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, I know that there was meetings that continue to happen. Uh, I'm not aware of, of an agreement on, on uh, Senator Talbot's bill before I came in here. There, there are discussions taking place. Um, obviously, uh, the legislature is going to go into a special session tonight uh, because it didn't take up the money bills and many of the essential things that we need as a state. Uh, to move forward, uh, and, and I will have more comments about what the legislature did uh, when it concludes its work and, and, and we know um, the, the bills that passed and have an opportunity uh, to review them. I, I will tell you it has been a very um, unique session uh, in, in the sense that it was uh, interrupted by such a, a long recess uh, and then the um, lack of access that the public has had and, and, and so forth uh, over the last several weeks. Um, and we're, we're going to uh, take a, a good look at, at all of the different bills that, that get sent up to me 
uh, by the legislature. And we look forward to having a productive uh, special session because, as you know, Melinda, we, we have to have a budget come July 1st. Uh, we, we, we can't run a deficit, and, and so we have to have a budget in place when the, when the new fiscal year starts. Uh, that's critically important, and so we're going to be working with the legislature uh, to make sure that those essential bills that they didn't get to uh, in, in this regular session are the things that, that they focus on and get those done uh, in the special session. Yes, sir. Governor, it looks like the uh, legislature is going to put on a bill on your desk. It would take the $300 million of the CARES Act money and send it towards small businesses. Uh, I'm wondering, is that a non-starter for you? Are you going to veto that bill? And do you think that the, you need the legislature to appropriate that, appropriate that money for the bill, or can you do it on your own? Well, if, if you will recall, when we submitted the uh, both the supplemental uh, bill to the legislature and the appropriations bill uh, to the legislature. It included all the CARES Act money. So, so there was never a time where I or Commissioner Darden didn't anticipate and try to have all of that money appropriated. We think that that's, that's the best way to do it. Um, and, and so I don't, I'm not sure where that confusion ever, ever came up. Uh, I don't have that bill yet. I haven't been able to read it. I don't believe it is finally passed, and I don't ever sit up here and tell you what I'm going to do or not do uh, before I have an opportunity to, to read a bill. Um, and, and so it, it, will, it will depend on what the conference committee does, what that final product looks like. One more question, and, and Leo, you get it. <laughs> Well, um, I don't, I don't know that, because um, I, I want to make sure I understood your question. I don't think the Freeport McMoran offer to settle has been tabled. I think that I think that's that still remains pending, and and obviously it is contingent upon uh, some other things happening. The bill that was introduced, uh, that was I believe an effort to derail that, is what got tabled. Uh, and so we have to see how that plays out going forward. As you know, these lawsuits started uh, in 2013 uh, by parishes uh, who were, were filing a suit under express statutory authority given them uh, in the coastal um, management program. And the state hasn't filed any such lawsuits. Uh, so so I, I believe that the, the uh, uh, best thing that can happen is is for the courts to determine whether or not there's liability uh, and damages, and if so, uh, what what that looks like uh, and and go forward. Uh, it would be my hope that. Uh, and and by the way, I don't. I've never heard anybody say anything other than, if damages are recovered, the damages ought to be spent on the coast uh, where the damages occurred in order to to. Uh, uh, do as many coastal restoration protection projects as possible. And I know that that was what animated some of the concern that we heard about uh, in, in this session. Uh, I think that that's, that's the way this is going to play out. Uh, but, but going forward, I, you know, we, we have cases that have been filed, uh, some as long as seven years ago. And, and I think it's time that we find out whether, whether the courts believe uh, that there's liability and damages, and, and if so, how much that is, but, but any recovery needs to be spent on the coast. Uh, so we will be back uh, with you all when, Christina? Wednesday at 2.30. Wednesday at 2.30. Some of the questions you asked today will probably be more appropriate Wednesday at 2.30. But thank you so much.